Hi, everyone, and welcome to part two of our air tightness uh, webinar on air tightness testing. My name is Adam Jones, and my colleague from Amy, Amy Pound from Sustainable Buildings Canada uh, will be managing the webinar today. We have Scott Armstrong and Taya Brzezinski from WSB and Mary Sai from Enbridge Gas. Um, today's webinar will, if you were here yesterday, you'll know how it's going to run. Uh, we'll have a presentation on air tightness testing and we'll ask you to uh, type out any questions you have into the chat box uh, or the question area. And we have a Q&A portion at the end and I neglected to mention Ernesto Diazzo Lozano from Bill USB as well. Um, all right, I'm going to hand things over to Mary from Enbridge Gas. Mary? Thanks, Adam. Good afternoon, everyone. And as Adam says, welcome to the fourth webinar presented by Enbridge Gas and Sustainable Buildings Canada. This is part two of the two-part series, How to Design Performance Envelopes. As Adam said, my name is Mary Sai, and I'm from Enbridge Gas, and I'm the energy advisor for a commercial new construction program, Savings by Design. Our goal today is to give an overview and provide solution as to designing an airtight building and to answer questions about how to achieve it using our program, Savings by Design Workshop. For those of you who are not familiar with Savings by Design, it's an image program that is facilitated by Sustainable Buildings Canada that supports builders, developers, and municipalities in achieving 15% energy efficiency above current code. Please reach out to me should you want to learn more. Some of the questions we'll be answering today include durability and resilience, materials, constructability, cost, testing and verification, along with commissioning. Following the webinar today, a link will be sent out on how to access this information that is presented. As you know, the webinar will be recorded, so don't worry if there's a few things you may have missed. You'll have another chance to review the content. Also, we'd love to hear from you as well on how we're doing during our live Q&A after the webinar. So please hold on to any questions until then, or as Adam says, put it into the chat. And if you'd like to reach out to me directly, I can be contacted at Mary dot sci at enbridge.com or my cell number 416-420-9281. Thank, thank you again for joining today and I'll hand it back off to Sustainable Buildings Canada to begin. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. I'll pass it over to Scott Armstrong from WSP to take us through air tightness testing. Thank you, Adam. Confirm you can see my screen. Great. Thanks again to, to um, Enbridge and to Sustainable Buildings Canada for, for letting us um, take a little bit of your time and, and walk through some uh, lessons learned uh, and approaches to air tightness testing based on some of our experience, uh, as well as in the local context of the Toronto market. To introduce the team, um, we have today Taya Te Berstinski uh, and Ernesto Patino. He's, uh, they're both building science consultants with WSP. Uh, Len Gorillian is the senior project manager with WSP uh, who can't join us. And I'm Scott Armstrong, one of our senior facade specialists uh, based in the Toronto office when I'm not in my lovely shed. In terms of an agenda today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the background behind air tightness testing. We're going to talk about some of the market trends. Uh, we're going to touch on the um, the standards and procedures that are used uh, for conducting air tightness testing. And then to give you a sense of what that looks like in practice, we're gonna go over a few case studies and that's where I'm gonna pass it over to Taya and, and Ernesto. And then we're gonna close with a few lessons learned. Our expectations of buildings has changed considerably over the years. Um, back when we were permitted to travel, I took this photo in the, the French Alps. Um, I wouldn't mind spending a night there if I was socked in, but uh, in terms of air tightness, it doesn't really deliver the kind of performance that we might expect from our modern buildings and building enclosures. Sorry, Scott, I, would I have also... to interrupt you. Yep. For some reason, we're not seeing, um, we're seeing your title slide. Ah. We had uh, advanced. Oh, that's interesting. There we go, now, uh, now we see a slide that says background, is that correct? Okay, yep, I'll switch where I'm doing this then. Okay, let's try this. Um, no, I lost it, there we go. Um, but before we get too far, I do wanna stop 
and just acknowledge the fact that all of this to me is about durability, that uh, durability is really what underpins our work. Uh, if we're not building buildings that last, uh, we're wasting our time. And uh, we do want to focus on thermal performance. We want to build thermally efficient and uh, that enclosures that deliver energy efficient buildings. Um, we have to do uh, that um, enclosure for thermal performance in a moisture safe way. Uh, and we also have to focus on air leakage. If we flip this around the other way and we look at air leakage and what it affects, uh, we do know that it has a significant impact on indoor air quality or indoor environmental quality. It definitely does affect thermal comfort. Uh, it will affect durability, so we could have moisture transport into the walls, which causes performance issues. And of course, it has an energy implication. So um, air leakage affects durability, but then you can see, um, or air leakage is a component of durability, but then you can see how air leakage affects all of these other aspects of building performance. Also, as a reminder, uh, you, you learned yesterday a little bit about uh, stack effect uh, and likely HVAC pressure, wind pressure, and all of these forces combined that create these really complex environments within buildings. And so air tightness testing um, helps us understand how the building enclosure performs, uh, but it doesn't necessarily address uh, all of these other factors. These are things that need to go into how we consider the construction and, um, and durability and maintenance of enclosures. And then of course we have to keep uh, water out, we have to be thermally efficient, we have to be able to build these things. Um, sometimes it's easy to conceive of a detail on paper that is not achievable in the field. Uh, and so we have to think about that when we're designing buildings. And we have to think about maintenance, uh, we don't want wasted durability. We don't want things that are hidden in the wall that fail that then require us to take apart significant portions of the wall to address uh, a minor component. And of course, not the least important thing is, as, is aesthetics. Uh, buildings are, are, we want them to be beautiful because that will encourage us to take care of them. Air leakage is not readily visible in buildings. Uh, sometimes we can feel it, um, but one of the tools that we use is infrared thermography. And infrared thermography helps us to diagnose uh, potential uh, sites for air leakage or sources of air leakage. Um, we were discussing this in the uh, uh, in our internal workshop, and these images are flipped around mostly for, for drama, but uh, this is a building under negative pressure where the interior of the building is at a negative pressure relative to the outside. So essentially we're trying to um, bring air or suck air into the building. Uh, and what this does when we use an infrared camera uh, is it shows us uh, where uh, thermal bridging is occurring. So we can see heat signatures, and I'm gonna try to use the laser and hope that I don't lose the ability to switch slides. So you can see thermal bridging around some of the precast anchors. You can see thermal bridging at the joints. You can see thermal bridging around the window perimeter. Now, if we pressurize the interior, or we essentially try to inflate the building, this is what we see. We see all of the air leakage that's occurring at these uh, joints. Now, these are large precast panels with punch windows in the middle. Um, and so using these tools, using pressure and using infrared thermography, or maybe uh, uh, smoke pencils or tracer gases or other tools, we can start to uh, see uh, where air leakage is occurring. You may have seen this um, slide in yesterday's presentation. Uh, it's a very interesting study done by RDH, who was yesterday's presenter, uh, talking about how ventilation and air, uh, vent ventilation in buildings rather works, um, and they measured uh, tracer gas as it was as it migrated to different levels of suites um, to show that corridor pressurization doesn't really work to provide adequate ventilation. But what I find really interesting is um, on the parking garage side, uh, that same tracer gas uh, migrates up into the occupied space um, readily. And that's largely through connected spaces like stairwells or elevator shafts or unintended openings through floor slabs that have not been effectively sealed. This is a a study of a number of buildings. These are schools, um, all that have been normalized to 75 pascals, uh, and their air leakage rate average was 1.2, 1.12 liters per second per meter squared. Uh, and you'll see these numbers uh, floating around a few different examples, and 
that touches on some of the inconsistency in the market and some of the challenges with comparing buildings to buildings. Um, but uh, for reference, the Toronto Green Standard cites a target of two liters per second meter squared. Um, so that's a little bit above the, uh, the mean rating um, and also well above the United States um, uh, Air Barrier Association of 1.12 and then the desired ultra low air leakage rate for the uh, 2010 NBC system recommendation. If we look at, um, again, a different set of whole buildings, this is now uh, normalized flow at 50 pascals. Um, you can see that uh, uh, they vary significantly across the, the uh, across the entire profile of all these buildings. Um, and then if we compare that to a a series of buildings uh, with done uh, with whole suite testing, um, then you, you can also see there's a high amount of variability in both the building, the entire building, the whole building, and the individual suite. And we'll dive into what that looks like uh, and how some of those targets relate to each other uh, in a few slides. In terms of the market trends, um, we're going to start with a very simplistic uh, rendering. So we're going to start on the left with less leakage and move to the right with more leakage. We're going to put some of these uh, points of reference in place so that we understand where different systems rate air leakage in importance uh, and what some of the different targets are across the market. Certainly the most stringent of all air leakage requirements uh, is Passive House. Um, and there are a number of metrics being used. Uh, you can see ACH 50 or CFM per square foot or liters per second per meter squared. Um, it's important to note that these are all, some of these are conducted at different pressures. Uh, we've tried to kind of equate numbers where possible um, or make them in the same units and same pressures, but it's a little difficult without knowing more of the geometry of the building itself. Uh, there are some uh, fixed conversion um, uh, conversion factors, but uh, we haven't done that for every box across the page. Energy Star for new homes, uh, 2.5 ACH, so significantly higher. This is also for Southern Ontario um, and uh, uh, and Mid-Eastern Ontario. The U.S. Army Corps, um, they have an, a target that is, as I said before, 1.27 liters per second per meter squared. And then, of course, the Toronto Green Standard, which is relevant to maybe a number of people on this particular call, uh, as well as people who may be developing in Toronto and elsewhere, um, or who think that these regulations may eventually come uh, outside the Toronto area. Uh, it's also important to note, we'll talk, I'll talk about this, about this in a bit more detail, that air tightness testing is required uh, for all Tier 2 projects under Toronto Green Standard Version 3, Tier 2 and above, and there are documented deliverables required at the IFC or the construction document stage uh, and at occupancy. So if you are currently building a project that is under the um, under the framework of Toronto Green Standard version 3, uh, you should definitely be thinking about air tightness testing and documenting your practice and procedures for it. Uh, LEED, many people may be familiar with LEED environmental tobacco smoke credit and the sweet air testing, air, air tightness testing that's required. And, uh, and so we put that here uh, as a point of reference. It's sort of in the range of, like I said, um, the units are a little bit weird. This is four pascals versus some of these at 50. Um, but it's, it's right around in this U US Army Corps kind of range. And then it's also important to note that code uh, does not have a, a target. There's no requirement in code for air tightness. It just says provide an air barrier that's structurally supported and resistant to airflow, um, but there's no specific leakage target. Um, there are requirements for how to model air tightness or air leakage. Um, and as we said before, air leakage definitely influences energy performance, uh, but without a way to measure that, um, taking benefit for Reduced air, reduced air leakage in an energy model is, is a little tricky. So if you are going to pursue energy savings as a result of improved air tightness, uh, you should definitely be setting those targets in your specs, tracking it and monitoring it, and then testing it to validate that. And recognizing that there is a risk that if you miss your target, you will not hit your energy performance 
um, goals. Ashray Fundamentals Chapter 16 has three very broad buckets for air tightness. A leaky building is three liters per second per meter squared. The average building is about 1.5 liters per second meter squared. And a tight building is 0 0.5. So you can see a tight building is in that range of passive house. An average building is maybe slightly better than the current Toronto Green Standard target of two. Uh, very simplistically, again, materials are rated on their own. Assemblies are rated as systems, and we're talking about the whole building. Uh, so they tend to step up in order of magnitude. That's how a lot of these, um, how a lot of these uh, benchmarks or, or targets have been set. To be frank, um, that if you take a material, you multiply it by ten, that's what an assembly should achieve. You multiply that by ten, that's what a whole building should achieve. There isn't a, this isn't necessarily a lot more science behind it, but just to put that into perspective. Um, of what that target looks like. This would represent the hole in the building for the whole building. The importance of QAQC, uh, it is critical that um, you, tr you both uh, plan and track uh, your progress and, act and activities to achieving air tightness. Uh, it's, you have to focus on the details. It, you have to set a target um, and you have to require proof of compliance. In construction, it's important to identify someone who is, we put here quotes, the air barrier champion. So this is a person or um, maybe a very small team, depending on the complexity of the project, who has uh, ultimate authority and responsibility for the air tightness of the building. You get subcontractor buy-in, you review details and penetrations, you get proper oversight during construction, everyone is involved, but one person is responsible. And so if if a subtrade, for example, needs to run a new pipe and that has to go through a penetration that has been identified as a critical assembly for the air tightness of the building, a penetration detail has to be developed and that has to be reviewed and validated. Uh, otherwise, again, your target will not be met. And then post-construction or just pre-post-construction would be to start the air tightness testing process through a series of qualitative uh, tests as well as finally with a quantitative test. And of course, uh, if, you're, if you've ever been in my kitchen, this is often what happens. Uh, without proper QAQC, we end up with a bit of a mess on the right. Let's talk a little bit about some of the testing procedures. The testing procedure cited in the Toronto Green Standard is ASTM E3158. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a method for doing E779. Um, and in the in the Toronto Green Standard air uh, air tightness guide guidance document, there are a number of other references, and I've included them here. Uh, if you're looking into air tightness testing, it's good to be familiar with all of these standards and reference guides, uh, just so that you have a very clear and broad picture uh, of what's required in order to uh, test for air tightness. It's also important to understand whether you are doing an envelope only or an operational test or an operational envelope. The building envelope only, only uh, it's a little hard to see in this diagram, but it, it essentially eliminates all of the intentional penetrations, uh, things like mechanical penetrations or pipes. Um, you know, the, the, the HVAC system would be sealed off and, and taped, not it would be closed. Um, whereas under the operational envelope, you're testing the building as though it were under proper operation. So when you occupy the building, you don't tape over your uh, ERVs or your bathroom fans, uh, your building would not function. So the air tightness testing required for Toronto Green Standard is under that protocol. It's the operational envelope. It's the expected air leakage when the building is operating under normal, uh, normal conditions. There are two main tests for buildings, um, the guarded test and the whole building test. A guarded test is, um, is a procedure where you, you have a test zone. So I've picked a, a community center and I've, I've, I always um, like to focus on the pool because I, if you walk into most community centers, you can immediately smell the pool. And in really poorly constructed ones, you can smell the pool before you even get there. Um, so you may wanna test air tightness for this particular zone. Um, 
Now you may want to test air tightness for the pool as it relates to other interior spaces, but I'm really interested in air tightness for the exterior enclosure. So I'm going to pressurize uh, the, the zone here and the zone around it um, to make sure that there's a zero pressure difference across those planes so that really when I measure in this zone, I'm really only measuring the exterior uh, perimeter walls here. Compare that to a whole building test where I'm just gonna put a whole bunch of fans in any door that I can. I'm gonna similarly pressurize the entire facility, measure the flow, and I'm gonna get a whole building test for that entire facility. Now this is quite straight, a little bit more straightforward for a single story building like maybe a community center or two story building. Uh, but when we get into high rise buildings, it becomes quite a bit more complex uh, and a lot more uh, planning and, and uh, generally then cost also is required to, to execute the test. Uh, this is a photo I took walking around the office building uh, one day. So here's a condominium. Under Toronto Green Standard, you're required to, to do three tests, um, one at the podium, uh, one at the at the mid-rise or, or the uh, typical floor, and then one at the roof. Uh, in order to test this floor at the in the tower, you have to do a guarded test. You have to similarly pressurize the space above and the space below so that you're not measuring air leakage through the floor. You're only measuring air leakage through the enclosure. Uh, and so what that requires is for you to, as I said before, similarly pressurize the floors directly above. Um, you can imagine this gets uh, a little bit complex when you have things like uh, cranes, tower cranes, or material hoists, or um, you know maybe other strips of the enclosure that are not yet installed. So you may need to isolate those zones. That's all part of the air tightness testing protocol that is the that is one of the deliverables for the IFC submission to um, to your uh, uh, Toronto Green Standard submission. Um, the City of Toronto does provide, I apologize this came out of order, but they do provide some guidance. Uh, we assisted with writing the, uh, the guidance document that's available on their website and a link is provided here. Um, as I mentioned, it is required for all TGS version 3 projects tier 2 and above. Um, you are required to provide verification at IFC and at occupancy. Um, however, you're only required to report the results. Um, and you are to record, report your results uh, per liters per second per meter squared. If you miss the two, two liters per second per meter squared target, there's no penalty for that. The, the purpose of introducing air tightness testing in Toronto Green Standard version 3 at this stage is to both uh, increase capacity in the market to deliver this service, as well as to inform future potential targets uh, and whether or not it makes sense to make those targets even more stringent. Um, the reality is that there is not a lot of data on how airtight our existing buildings are. There's not a lot of data on how airtight our new construction buildings are. And so this whole mechanism of doing airtightness testing on many, many new buildings uh, is, is intended to help gather that data so that airtightness could be better understood uh, and uh, potentially better targets uh, or more specific targets for specific types of buildings, if those are proving to be less airtight, are then implemented by the city. Uh, there are a number of requirements. I won't read through these uh, to avoid the PowerPoint sing-along phenomenon. Uh, you can download the document at the, at the link that I had previously. Uh, and I read through it there. Again, there are references to other standards and, and, um, and some suggestions in terms of uh, the deliverables that are required, including these uh, specific, uh, specific requirements. So that's the overview of, um, of where we are in, in the market today and generally speaking, how these, um, how these tests are conducted. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Taya and she's gonna walk through uh, a couple of case studies that demonstrate uh, how this is how this is implemented. Taya? Great. Thanks, Scott, for the introduction. Um, so I'm based uh, in southwestern Ontario out of our Hamilton office. So both the projects I'll be talking about are in that region. Uh, the first one, uh, Scott had previously mentioned the passive house standard. 
Uh, one of the projects that we were involved in for air leakage testing was right here, downtown Hamilton. Um, at the time, it was the largest passive house retrofit project. So the, the target uh, air tightness is 1.0 air changes per hour at a pressure of 50 pascals. This is less stringent than a new construction passive house, which requires the 0 0.6 that was previously mentioned. So in, including the basement level, uh, we had about 4,300 square meters of occupied space. And as part of the mandate, uh, there we performed three tests. So the first test is right after the air barrier is installed, uh, before we have any interior finishes. Uh, during that time, we when we were on site, we identified any air leakage paths. So this is typically around windows, around doors, uh, any mechanical that might have been installed at the time. Uh, we would test a second time after all those deficiencies are corrected, and then again right before occupancy. This kind of three test method is uh, prescribed in the Passive House standards. That's where it comes from, uh, in, from their guide for air leakage testing. As part of this process, there was uh, alongside, we were doing the actual testing, but we did have a consultant who was assisting with, uh, as Scott mentioned, creating a plan for any and all penetrations that were going through the building envelope. So that was done through Fourth Pig Consulting. Uh, next slide. So uh, that's me two years ago, <laughs> but, uh, so I, I was involved mostly with the, the third and, and final test, which was, uh, which was completed again prior to occupancy. As part of the mandate, we Passive House does require that certain uh, components are complete and closed prior to the actual testing of the, the envelope. Uh, this one here, given the size, uh, performed very well. Uh, we had great results, uh, as mentioned in the previous slide. This, the minimum, uh, or the max, sorry, the maximum air changes per hour is 1.0, and they surpassed that goal by a significant margin. And uh, I didn't write it down, but by they achieved an air tightness of about 0 0.32 air changes per hour, which is even better than uh, the mandate for an original new construction passive house. So, uh, as part of the passive house standards, that they do require that you uh, test the envelope in a positive and negative pressure state. Uh, this is to account for any and all possible um, penetrations or air leakage locations that could exist. And again, that's mandated by the Passive House Institute for their testing. Uh, prior to actually getting the results at the pressure of 50 pascals, we pressurized the envelope uh, in both directions, again, positive and negative, uh, at 80 pascals. Uh, Part of that process as well as we walk around the building at different elevations, uh, different stories at the building, and we take an understanding, we want to get an understanding if the whole building is pressurized as a single zone. So that's done. Uh, all of our results, there was a pretty even pressure throughout the building, even though we just had the one fan set up. So that was done, uh, and then we would test at the 50 pascals, and then we obtained our result of 0 0.3 air changes per hour. So that was pretty exciting. Um, so that's a small project in Hamilton that we had done. Uh, here are results summarized. So we provided uh, positive and negative pressure results, and then we take an average of the two. Uh, when we are providing our test parameters, this is not actually uh, one of the standards mentioned previously. It, Passive House does, does have their own standards. And again, as we can see, they achieved a, an amazing result. And this comes from the combined efforts of really prioritizing the air barrier as um, the main component to success for this building. So that's exciting to see. Um, on the other hand, um, this was another project where we were doing kind of a full building envelope analysis. Uh, the primary goal here was to identify any air leakage locations, develop some remedial strategies uh, for this school. It's This is a very small school. Um, it's about 1,700 square meters of floor area. There's only 12 classrooms here. It's single story for most of the building. And we can see in that top photo, it, there's a two-story portion. Uh, it's 
built late 50s. There's a crawl space under the entire building, which in the dead of winter was about 35 degrees um, and very humid. So it's holding a lot of heat. It's just not actually getting through to the rest of the building. Uh, so considering the small footprint of this building, it was taking up a lot of energy um, on the school board's um, energy portfolio. So next slide. A uh, couple interesting findings from our, our various testing. So because the, because the envelope was so not airtight, we weren't able to do a whole building uh, pressure test. We had to separate the school into two zones. Based on the geometry of the building, it made the most sense to separate into where the single story classrooms are. That's the red portion uh, that's kind of outlined and the two story portion was its own. Uh, separating the zone, there's not too much we could do. We, there was a set of double doors that we had taped fully uh, in order to separate these two zones. And we, we tested each one separately and uh, took a weighted average to get the, the final result. Uh, part of, we were able to discover why it wasn't so airtight based on the IR images, which complemented the report very well in this case. Uh, if we take a look at the bottom IR images, there is a kind of an eyebrow soffit that runs around almost the entire perimeter of the, the building. And as we can see, there's quite a lot of uh, heat coming out of that area uh, when we did the positive and negative pressure. So it, it's no surprise that we are losing a lot of heat given that this is around the entire building. So as the last building was about um, 0 0.3 air changes per hour, this one was about five and a half air changes per hour. So significantly uh, poorer performer overall uh, compared to the passive house. Um, yeah, and once we did our visual review, we could see that there was no present air barrier and it was actually leading to some minor deterioration at that soffit connection. So really just tying in that durability, as, as much as we want well uh, performing buildings from an energy standpoint, we do also want them to stand the test of time. And if we have condensation issues like this coming up, then we need to be able to identify them. And this test helped do that for, um, for the client. Going to the next slide. Um, one of our recommendations, this is something we typically see for new construction when we're, uh, when fire stopping is required, uh, but it, essentially a spray applied elastomeric fire stopping material was recommended. Uh, you can use mineral wool as a backer for this product and it would overall improve the, the roof to wall transition. Uh, the crawl space upgrade, we, uh, we knew it would be very extensive, so there wasn't a, a, a point for this uh, for this client's budget to really recommend that. And then ideally we would like to recommend a holistic overclad to address any of the, the smaller um, air leakage issues. But yeah, this, this product here, the, the spray is not, the spray applied elastomeric is not overly expensive and pretty feasible um, for, for those to do. So um, yeah, that was our solution. It hasn't been implemented yet, but we're hoping to see it go into fruition soon. Uh, I think that's all for me. Thanks, Taya. Uh, we'll turn it over to Ernesto, and he'll talk about one of the new construction projects we're currently working on uh, and how we're uh, conducting air tightness testing there for Daniels. Thanks, uh, thanks Taya. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ernesto. I'm based off our Toronto office. And um, the project uh, I'm going to be talking about is part of uh, the larger region park uh, redevelopment in Toronto. So. I don't know how many are familiar with the city, but uh, this is a large area of the city that has been in constant redevelopment for the past, I want to say 14 or so years. Lots of cool and exciting projects uh, in the area. And this is um, a new townhouse block um, construction. So we're, what we were doing is we're going to be doing air tightness testing uh, to check for compliance with the TGS and also uh, to provide information of um, air leakage pass. So we're going to be also looking at qualitative air leakage testing to see where air was uh, coming in and out. Um, so any uh, gaps in the air barrier could be addressed while the building is still being built. Next slide, please. Oh, 
Thank you. Um, so what we do for this kind of new construction air tightness testing is actually we, we do a site visit before planning um, the test just to make sure that the building is ready to be tested. Um, we call this a verification site visit. Um, so for example, in this project, when we came and looked at the suites that have been proposed for testing, we noted that there was some drywall that hadn't been installed. And since that drywall was part of the air barrier, it needed to go in and be taped and be completed before we could test. There were some penetrations that needed to be sealed through the envelope. Um, the doors, uh, the door locks have not been installed. So we needed to um, ask uh, the developer to seal those. And also um, at this stage of the construction, the HVAC equipment was not in. So as Scott mentioned, uh, there's uh, envelope only tests and there's mechanical, uh, sorry, whole building, like full building tests, operational tests. Um, we decided with the client that we're going to be doing at this point only an envelope test. So all the HVAC penetrations needed to be temporarily sealed. So this visit, we compile all this information and we send it to the to our clients so they can um, prepare the buildings uh, before we come to site. Next slide, please. And then we actually come and do the test. So we split our test in two, in two portions. So we have a qualitative test and a quantitative test. So we do the qualitative test first uh, for a few reasons. And one is to just see if our equipment is gonna work well uh, in the size of the building, iron out, any, iron out any issues, but also see if there's any penetrations that need to be sealed that we missed that were part of that uh, verification. So uh, to do the qualitative test, we install the blower door, we deploy a fog machine, um, the typical fog machine that you would use in a party, and we positively pressurize the building. So what we're doing is we're pumping air into the building so that air will exfiltrate through any unsealed uh, penetrations. And we have uh, staff walking around the building. Um, and uh, here's a video showing you what happens when there's a penetration that wasn't sealed. So you see this fog uh, coming out. So um, it's a very fun and visual way of, of figuring out what's happening. So we walk around the building and we compile all these uh, observations um, that we, and then we bring in the client to discuss. Uh, some can easily be sealed on the spot, some may need a bit more work. And once we're done with that, then uh, next slide please, we move on to our quantitative testing. So as Scott was mentioning, um, uh, we need to isolate the area where we're going to be testing. So if we were going to test, our, in, in this particular case, we're going to be testing suite seven that's highlighted in blue. So if we're gonna follow the standard ASTM E779, that would have required us to um, match the pressure in the test suite in all the adjacent four suites, because the standard wants to only test the envelope, which means there cannot be any pressure difference across the demising walls. So in total, we would have needed five lower door kits um, to, to conduct this. Uh, unfortunately, due to equipment limitations, we could not the test, uh, do the test like that. So what we decided to do was to do two tests. So we we're gonna do test one, where we would have uh, the exterior doors and windows open in all the adjacent four suites. And then at the second test, where we we're gonna have all those exterior doors and windows closed. The intent of this was to see if it would actually make a difference because the demising walls are built pretty airtight. And even though we did identify a few areas of leakage, overall, we expected that uh, that most of the leakage would occur through the envelope. So we didn't think it would make a huge difference if the other suites weren't pressurized or not. And by by doing two tests with the, the, the suites open and closed, we would be comparing two scenarios. In the first one, the adjacent suites are at atmospheric pressure. So there's a bigger, so in theory, the delta P between the envelope is equal to the delta P across the demising walls. In the second test, this adjacent suites act as a sort of a buffer zone. They're not at atmospheric pressure, but they're also not at the same pressure as our unit. And if these two tests give us similar results, then we can say with a degree of confidence that not pressurizing the adjacent suite doesn't make a huge difference. Um, but this is a good um, uh, uh, point to make when you're planning for uh, early cash testing in townhouse blocks that you know testing one suite can have significant significant equipment requirements. I, I also live in a townhouse block in Regent Park and my unit is actually a stack on top of another one. So then you have to deal with three dimensions. So it can actually be a lot of equipment for a single small, you know, 1500 square feet townhome. Next slide, please. 
Um, so then we, we carry out our test and um, uh, here as per ASTM 779, for each of those two tests, we have to do a pressurization or, or a depressurization and a depressurization test. So four, four tests in total. And uh, one, imp one interesting thing that we've always observed, and uh, I think this will be true for most uh, ASTM E779 tests, is that the pressurization curve is always higher than the depressurization curve. Um, so you do the test and then, uh, next slide please. And then with the with the um, with the test result, you can calculate the um, air changes per hour and the equivalent leakage area. So in, I'm sh we're showing you right now what we found for our test two. Both tests were very similar. We didn't use test one results because uh, there was a lot of wind and we didn't meet the required cor uh, correlation coefficient. So we're showing you test two. Um, Firstly, we found that the uh, surface leak, uh, liters per second per meter square um, air leakage met the TGS B2 requirements. And this was true whether we took the surface area of only the envelope or also included the demising walls. Um, and then uh, we also found that the air changes per hour of 50 pascals was actually better than the passive house target. I know that we didn't test as per the passive house standard, but regardless, the results are pretty promising and overall show that these buildings are very airtight, which is fantastic news. Um, next slide, please. So I'll pass it over now to Scott. Sure, I have one slide on some lessons learned and then Ernesto has a few other things to share. And I'm gonna share, I'm gonna break these down into uh, execution as well as some of the market trends. As I said off the top, it is critical to set goals. Uh, you need leadership uh, and responsibility for air tightness. And if you don't have uh, these things, uh, you will not achieve your goals. Uh, in real estate, location is key and air tightness testing planning is key. You have to plan every stage and, and every eventuality and then execute and check regularly. And this, this is from design all the way through to construction and the actual testing that occurs. It's critical that we engage all designers, trades, sub-trades, and the commissioning team, including your enclosure commissioning team, if you are so uh, engaging on that side. Um, and when I say all designers, I mean I mean it. I, you know, the structural designers, the mechanical, electrical designers, everyone has a role to play in air tightness. Uh, and not a lot of these other uh, designers uh, develop very comprehensive details for penetrations. And so it's critical that those get developed appropriately to achieve their air tightness target. If you're looking at modular or prefabricated systems, and I'm talking about things beyond curtain wall and window wall, I'm talking about uh, large scale panelized wall systems, the joinery between these systems is critical for air tightness. Um, there are many, there are some examples in the market where large panels were used and air, air tightness at the joints between those panels became uh, a weak point and required some remedial work to get them to perform. On the test day, well, it's not actually one test day, it's multiple days. Uh, and you have to account for things that you may not have expected like hoist bays or tower cranes or suites that maybe are used for storage and open to the outdoors. Uh, and so those have to be isolated in a way that uh, allows you to do the testing properly. In terms of market trends, uh, we do a lot of lead uh, sweet air tightness testing for environmental tobacco smoke credit. Uh, and there is definitely a trend towards tighter buildings. Uh, we do see that in the data that we have, um, that the suites themselves are quite airtight. Uh, and perhaps that's a proxy for uh, the actual air tightness for the building. Um, in our experience, uh, you know, towers at this point, um, with suites being relatively tight, we need to focus also on stack effect and on ventilation. Um, there are still some designers who insist that corridor ventilation works, which is misguided and, and is not true um, in most cases. And especially as we make our enclosures tighter and tighter, um, that it, it becomes less and less feasible to use that approach for ventilation. Again, for complex MERBs, uh, perhaps the podium um, or uh, in non-MERB uh, buildings or non-multi-use residential buildings like healthcare, commercial, institutional, and other types of buildings, those may be the buildings that best benefit from uh, air tightness related practices. Um, again, I've worked on a lot of uh, healthcare buildings or um, recreational buildings uh, and, and 
you know that in the public sector, you know, low cost tends to win. And when that happens, uh, sometimes things like air tightness can be compromised. And so it's, I think that these kinds of buildings could benefit fairly tremendous, fairly significantly from uh, from having some air t some some rigor around air tightness testing. Ernesto. Thanks, Scott. Um, so I wanted to after lessons learned, I wanted to to talk a little bit about beyond air tightness testing to kind of bring a full circle in our conversation. So Scott had started and motivated why air tightness is so important. And I think it's a very, very important uh, uh, value, variable of a building. But a uh, question remains, what happens after? Uh, air tightness testing is uh, a point in time where you look at a point in time in the very standardized conditions and you get out of a building. And that's great to compare buildings to buildings, but it doesn't tell you the full picture of how the building is going to perform in long term. And it also doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily tell you the full picture of your building stock. So there's these two papers that I want to briefly discuss. Um, the first one is uh, a study that uh, some folks at UFD did. Uh, what they did is they took indoor and outdoor CO2 measurements and using sig signal processing algorithms from electrical and telecommunications engineering, they were able to calculate the long-term uh, air changes per hour of a building. Now, this would be all the air change. It would be the ventilation, um, the natural infiltration, et cetera, et cetera. But basically you can see at the long term how a building is actually exchanging air with the exterior. And what's interesting to me is that the, the, the price of data analysis, the price of sensors is going down. So as we get more and more access to data in buildings, this kind of analysis are promising in terms of what we can do with that data we get from buildings. The second, bill, the second paper is uh, slightly older and it's from the States and what they did is uh, they looked at um, a huge data set of building air tightness testing results. Uh, I think it's in the order of uh, 90,000 or something like that and they developed a regression model to correlate explanatory variables such as building age, building height, um, location with buildings air changes per hour and when they made that uh, regression um, model you can, the value of it is that you can take their model and you can take um, information for a building that you don't know uh, its air changes per hour, you can, but you know its age, you know its location, you plug those values in and it will give you a pretty good estimate of the air changes per hour for that building. So what this shows is when you're doing more and more tightness testing and you're gathering all this data of different buildings, you can start doing really good, really interesting analysis so that you can use your data as a predictive tool for new buildings or, or if you're modeling a building for which you don't have test data. So, you know, in summary, uh, this is kind of thinking in the bigger picture of our tightness testing and this really interesting ideas that we can start looking at with, uh, with the data we gather. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Ernesto. Um, that concludes our presentation. Uh, we we understand someone's moderating the chat uh, chat window, and and we ha be happy to take questions at this point. Our contact information is also there if you'd like to reach out to any of us individually uh, directly outside the webinar. Thank you, Scott, um, and Taya and Ernesto. Um, while we see if there are any questions in the chat, I have a question for you um, about the spray applied elastomeric. Mm -hmm. um, there are, uh, I, I would say there are a lot of misconceptions about um, how this product can be used. Um, and it seems that a lot of people um, see it maybe as a bit of a magic pill for air tightness. Um, perhaps you could speak a little bit about the um, constraints of that product. So I just want to distinguish that this the product that we're talking about there is a is a spray applied air barrier product. It's an elastomeric air barrier product. It's not spray foam. So um, it is designed to, for this use. Uh, you know, we do have a lot of experience to your point with, with spray foam being used as an air tightness tool. And while it may work in some instances, um, in, in my opinion, it's not a it's not a durable solution, especially in in locations where you have a lot of movement uh, through expansion and contraction or uh, creep in buildings long term, uh, building sway or or other changes. Uh, you you can easily crack the bond line between the foam and the uh, and the material that you're trying to seal, and then you end up with an orifice leakage uh, that you were trying to avoid in the first place. 
whereas this elastomeric, we've used this on a few other projects. Uh, in addition to the suggestion at the school that Tay was mentioning, I we did a retrofit on a, about a 15-story commercial office building that was recently constructed that had um, massive air leakage issues at the roof uh, where they had a very, very large parapet uh, flyby or, or oversail. Um, and so we were able to effectively compartmentalize and basically shut off the parapet from the interior space to to address air leakage as well as other uh, performance issues like condensation and and staining that was occurring on the curtain wall and on the ceiling system because of that air leakage. Thank you. Okay, there is one question in the chat for you guys um, from Edward. Is there a major difference between uh, 50 PA and 75 PA in testing? Uh, I might kick that over to Ernesto. My my opinion is yes. It, it well yes. not necessarily a difference, but it's there's a conversion factor. Um, so Ernesto, you want to talk a little bit about the slope line graph and and how that uh, is used? Sorry, I was muted. Um, typically, depending on the standard, we will test at a range of pressures. So for example, for lead, we start at 100 pascals and then bring our way down to you know, somewhere in the 50 neighborhood. For ASTM E779, we start at 60 and go down. Um, and then we'll get a line and an equation that we could use to predict the air changes at any pressure. So we don't, we don't test at 50 exactly, but the reported value for the standard, for several standards is that ACH at 50. So if you wanted to convert from ACH at 50 to ACH at 75, you could use that equation that you get from your data. Um, and the, the nature of the relationship is exponential. So you would see uh, a considerable difference between the air leakage at 75 pascals versus 50. But in terms of testing, you don't test a, typically a one pressure. Taking a step back, the, uh, the, the whole building air leakage uh, standard does have provisions to do one point test, uh, where you just bring it up to one point and bring it down. But in uh, most of the times we do the 10, 10 points approach, which gives you more data. I hope that answered the question. Okay, thank you, Ernesto. Um, Scott, maybe this is another one for you. Um, soffits, uh, because I know they're a particular focus of yours, um, are, uh, soffits are a, a big challenge in buildings, it seems, with air tightness. Um, and uh, I guess I'm wondering if you have any recommendations on how to approach soffits, uh, whether you should treat them like outdoor space um, and seal them against the building or treat them like indoor space and seal them all the way up. Uh, yeah, this is a softball. Um, I, so you should read my article if, with the creative title of How to Stop uh, about parapets and soffits. Um, you know, it it is a choice that you have to make and you can make it work either way, whether that soffit is treated as outdoor or indoor space, but you absolutely have to make a decision. I've seen far too many buildings where um, it was evident that there was no clear decision made about whether or not the soffit should be sealed um, or in cases where this, the soffit was intended to be closed off from the indoor space and intended to be outside, that closure was ineffective. Um, and I have some, well, Adam and, and Amy, you've seen in other presentations, these gross failures of soffit systems uh, as a result of that air leakage problem. Um, the other thing that we've seen, you know, from an energy efficiency perspective, the, the traditional condo approach, uh, well, traditional or at least I've certainly seen enough of it I have enough photos of it on my phone from walking around the city is to is the little radiator runaround loop that goes in the ventilated soffit space so you have a metal cladding system with a few blankets of insulation packed on top and then above that is a, a essentially a ventilated space that's outdoors with a with a hot water radiator um, so that is not very energy efficient it's probably providing a little bit of comfort for the floor above but um, I would call that sort of a quasi-indoor or a quasi-heated, quasi-ventilated soffit space, which from an energy perspective is not very uh, efficient. So um, the challenge with condos really is uh, tight floor to floor and the desire for sort of very thin, uh, thin soffit profiles, right? Having a nice clean line that is very tight to the slab. Um, it's really hard to to get a, a real buildup of a soffit in there with proper control layers and ventilation to make that inside space. So you have to decide, uh, and once you decide, commit <laughs> and make sure it's make sure it's sealed and or ventilated. 
uh, intentionally. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just reading one more question here. Go. Uh, what are some of the best practices for prepping a building for testing before the test team arrives? I don't know, Taya, you want to take that one? Uh, sure. Yeah, I was. Uh, from my experience, the I believe for at least the passive house project that we had done, it's usually a, a couple days actually on site of trades preparing. So, just being mindful of that uh, and sealing all the mechanical um, any HVAC that's coming out, especially if you're doing an envelope only test, which I believe is most of what we had talked about today. But um, just providing fair fair warning and really watching for weather conditions that they're adequate for the testing you definitely want a day with low wind um, to not interfere with uh, any of the testing that you're going to be doing and making sure everyone's on board and aware uh, generally when we're testing there's still construction going on and there's still work going on indoors so just constantly walking around and reminding everyone to you know leave all the interior doors open please keep all the windows closed um, you can't leave for the next hour essentially through any of the exterior doors and just uh just making everyone aware on site of what's going on it, re it really does require buy-in from the entire project team on site for that day so i would add yeah. to um we we did one a few weeks ago uh where we used that theatrical f smoke machine uh, and it generates a tremendous amount of smoke and so <laughs> you have to coordinate uh, with the site staff and they need to call the fire department to make sure that there's no no report or they don't send fire trucks because um, we have had that happen <laughs> on, on more than one project. So uh, again, it, it extends a little bit beyond the site. Everyone on the site for sure has to be aware of what's going on. And to Taya's point, you don't want people opening a door when you're at 50 pascals and ruining your tests. Um, but at the same time, you have to make sure that uh, you're not alerting the wider neighborhood um, to a potential problem in your building. Yeah. Okay, we have one more. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys can give specific recommendations, but Edward is wondering if there are many companies in the GTA that do air leakage testing. Uh, there is capacity building in, in the GTA for sure. Um, I mean, we're one of those firms. Um, I, I'm gonna get the nod either from Adam or Amy that I'm allowed to say out loud. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, there's um, building knowledge. I know. I believe RDH is doing our tennis testing. Um, uh, um, he, Austin Todd. I'm trying to remember the name of his company. He's uh, coefficient. Uh, co okay. Yeah, coefficient. Uh, they do air tightness testing. So I know Ryerson is also um, doing supporting uh, a lot of air tightness testing. Um, either doing it themselves as a research project or supporting other firms doing it. So that is really one of the goals of the TGS requirement is to try to build up local capacity because pre previously, like five years ago, you know, to find someone who did air tightness testing, very, very few options. And now uh, there are definitely uh, many more options. Uh, I think in the GTA, there are you know, probably half a dozen people or firms who can do it and probably as many as 30 available fans at any given time. So, it, you know, you could pretty much test anything now um, with the right uh, right people on board. If you didn't sure. catch all those names, just send me an email and I'll help you out. <laughs> I was just going to say the same thing. Um, yeah, there are, uh, clearly the, the building science consulting uh, world is, is tackling this uh, challenge. Um, and it's, we're, we're at our, our time on its own. I thank uh, everyone, uh, Scott, Ernesto, and Taya, um, for this wonderful webinar. Um, and thank you, everyone, who has uh, attended uh, today and yesterday. Um, to remind you, uh, both videos will be made available. You'll receive an email uh, follow-up by the end of this week with all the information on where you can find the videos and contact information for our presenters. Uh, so with that, I will sign off and thank you again one more time. I thank you. very much appreciate your, uh, your delivery today. Thanks again. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.